little bit about alternative therapies for cerebral palsy. What's out there today? Um, what are you excited about? What are you worried about? And then what do you think some of the real ethical challenges are around alternative therapies? I think, um, I think it's a big question. I think it's one of the biggest issues facing uh, the group of uh, children that I see. One of the things that I get lots of questions around is alternative therapies that uh, parents are anxious to explore uh, because it gives them hope. And I think it's very common whenever you have a chronic condition where there isn't a cure uh, that alternative therapies uh, pop up. Unfortunately, the scientifically validated uh, good things that we can offer are quite limited, which leaves people open to looking at everything else. And there are many examples, uh, far too many now, of people preying on the vulnerability of these families, and uh, I think it's a huge problem. So how do you help families who come to you with their children navigate some of the information that they gather on the internet, on radio, in newspapers? I think that's a big part of our job these days is uh, to guide them uh, in trying to help them interpret where they should place their hope and their efforts. I always try to bring it back to what um, the potential mechanism of action is. And sometimes it's hard to find that for alternative therapies, so I'm often talking about things at that level. And I try to do it in a way um, that is not attacking that particular therapy, that they feel that they can bring these questions to you and that you're not going to ridicule the alternative treatments that they want to explore. And we try to give them a, a warning up front that a lot of what they read may be bad information and that uh, things that sound too good to be true usually are. Be very careful and cautious about where they invest time and hope and energy um, to of course avoid doing any harm to their kids and I do put that out there especially when certain things like stem cells and other things come up that um, a you know nothing to lose approach is not a good reason to try usually uh, to try a treatment. So how do you counsel potential participants in choosing between experimental trials that might help them? Often the families will migrate to the ones that resonate uh, for them and uh, I think in the world of cerebral palsy we need to be doing more uh, randomized controlled trials and larger trials so that families are more engaged in research that really is going to guide uh, evidence. We try to be careful in promoting and recruiting children and parents into our studies to try a new treatment for cerebral palsy without you know, false expectation of hope or uh, overestimating the potential benefits. Hopefully the days are, are here or coming where kids with it's a certain type of CP um, can go online and see that their child qualifies for three different trials. I don't view my role as a decision maker, but more as a person that can provide information to help them way the aspects of exploring a, a treatment. So the knowledge translation that NeuroDevNet is so uh, motivated towards is very important in that regard to push out all the good information and to try and counter the bad I think and uh, um, I think that's a key going forward. So I'm hearing in summary that there's a real responsibility for researchers and clinicians to be open and transparent and available and patient mm -hmm. and for families and poten potential participants to really be informed and, and open to asking the right questions, mm -hmm. both scientific and uh, ethics ones, and not be swayed necessarily by what they hear in the media. Yeah, but uh, really are work true. really work collaboratively with the, the network of healthcare professionals to come to some good decisions. Mm -hmm.